went to their home for dinner and I uh, had no idea what I had just walked into. Um, it was um, to say that the gospel is disarming is a, uh, a gross underestimation. The Profile with Premier Christianity magazine. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. I'm Sam Hells, editor of Premier Christianity magazine. And you've joined us on the show today for The Profile, where we like to sit down with a different guest each and every week and hear something of their life story. I'm really pleased to say that our guest on the show today is Rosaria Butterfield. She is a former professor of queer theory and feminist studies, and she experienced in 1999 what she describes as a messy and dangerous conversion to Christianity. Rosaria has gone on to write a number of popular books, including The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, the Gospel Comes with a House Key, and most recently, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. Rosaria is married to Kent Butterfield, a Reformed Presbyterian pastor in North Carolina, and she is a homeschool mother, author, and speaker. Rosaria, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. It's my joy and pleasure to be here with you. Really looking forward to hearing uh, some of your story. We'd like to go back to the very beginning, if that's okay. Tell me a little bit about your upbringing. How were you raised? Was there any kind of Christian faith in your early life? Right. I was raised in a liberal Roman Catholic home by, um, I'm Italian, I'm named after the rosary, so um, that might give you the first clue. My parents were excommunicated Catholics. And I went to Catholic school, nonetheless, we lived in the city of Chicago, which is not exactly known either back in the dark ages or even now for its um, uh, successful government school program. So my parents sent me to the local uh, Roman Catholic school. My father would drop me off in the morning and he would say, Rosaria, I want you to be good, be kind, listen to everything the nuns say, and don't believe a word they say. So I was raised by um, by intellectual skeptics, and I went on to become one. The first time I love literature. I'm a, my my PhD is actually in English literature, and um, the my first uh, uh, the first time the nuns defined for me what um, a metaphor was, they used the example of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If that gives you a sense of just how very liberal my liberal Roman Catholic upbringing was. Yes. And tell me more about your parents. You mentioned they'd been excommunicated from the they church, had. but clearly they still saw the, the worth and the value of a Catholic education. So well, that's, what had led to that? Yes. No, I would say they saw the, the worth and the value of a private school education. And that might be just a a, a, a reality that is a, a different lexicon across the pond here. But uh, government or public schools in the United States have been... Um, um, pretty dysfunctional for a long time and quite violent as well. And uh, my parents, we lived in Chicago, which is not uh, this. We lived in a suburb of Chicago, but nonetheless, the schools were, uh, you know, even I'm 61 years old. So even decades ago, they were not safe and they were uh, they were just not very functional. I, I mean, right now, as a pastor's wife and as a Christian, I I speak before our local school boards regularly on the uh you know, just the scourge of transgenderism and um, the lack of parental rights. And, um, you know, quite frankly, if uh, to quote Heather McDonald's wonderful essay, if Johnny can't spell gay, it doesn't really matter that he is. And in some ways, that's not a recent problem for government education in the United States. So my parents really did that because it was a safe private school education. And they they were, you know, they wanted me to actually learn how to be a thinking person. Very much the if there was a gospel in my home, it was um, be a thinking person, think it through. Um, everything you need is, you know, between your ears. You don't need anything else. And um, and so it was only for that reason alone, I would say. You we're in a background, as you say, li liberal background. Everything you needed to know was between your two ears. Don't need any external authority from elsewhere. I guess as a child, you did you take you took that from your from your parents. Was there ever a clash between what you were hearing in a school setting and a, and a home setting in terms of faith? And did you find yourself opting for one over the other? 
Yes, in fact, all the time, and and it almost created a kind of dual language for me, and it was a, a, a wrestling. I mean, I definitely had many wrestlings of the soul um, as a young person, and then as an older person, and I'd say it's still having you know wrestlings of the soul. But I remember one time in particular, my my very favorite uh, Catholic priest. Um, came in to do a seminar and he he said, uh, if you think the only thing you need is what's between your ears. And I thought, well, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. He said, well, you're dead wrong. And I thought, oh, wait a second, what's that all about? So, um, and there are other wrestlings too. Um, I, I, I loved the nuns. I loved the discipline and the, the care and the um, just the kind of exact way of thinking i was you know we taught we were taught logic and latin and those things stick with me and i often had a hard time reconciling that with some of the other things going on in my home which were uh you know not great um uh in fact uh, i mean i don't know i'm i'm not of the age to use the word trauma quite as lightly as this generation does but there you know i had a a stepbrother who lived with us who is a drug addict and he sold drugs out of our house and uh, you know, needless to say, some of the friends he would bring home were not the nicest guys on the planet. And, um, uh, you know, and my mom had some unreconciled mental health issues. There are a lot of things that try as hard as I could. I couldn't work it out between my ears. And, and then in addition to that, there is that longing of the soul that um, Ecclesiastes right talks about the... Um, the you know that God has put uh, eternality in our hearts, and so this whole idea that all I had was what was between my ears and the, what I could see with my eyes seemed um, uh, you know just cheap and in some ways a sham. So there are a lot of wrestlings of the soul. Tell me a bit about what happened in your story next. What did you aspire to be when, if I were to ask you as, as a youngster, what do you want to be when you grow up? Was was kind of academia and studying, was that always always your desire? Yes, absolutely. I loved books. If I could just have a pile of books and a cat on my lap, I it was all good. Um, you know, add a cup of coffee to it and that's that's fantastic. So yes, absolutely. I actually toyed for a, a small, a little bit, with being a nun, um, which I know sounds really strange, but I there are many things about, um, and especially the kind of, oh, uh, the the Dorothy Day, uh, you know, line of thinking. Um, just uh, it was it was a way of being a legitimate do gooder in the world, and I thought, well, that would you know, I want to be a do gooder, and I, and I want to be legit, so that would you know, that's a good combination. Um, but ultimately, I became smitten with music and language with the arts and the letters. And so um, uh, I ended up uh, step by step, basically scholarship by scholarship, um, um, uh, pursuing a PhD in English literature. And um, and it was wonderful. I mean, I, I loved it. I started out as a music major, a, a voice, a voice vocal performance major with a dual uh, interest in in uh, English and and uh, and philosophy and history, and uh, then went on to do a master's degree in creative writing, which is so funny because I didn't end up using that until I wrote uh, the book Secret Thoughts decades later. But um, but I like I love the written word, and so it's not all that surprising, I suppose, when the Lord changed my heart that I just fell in love with the Word made flesh, right, and the. And the idea that a word could be made flesh and that he could be my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who tells me that his yoke is easy and burden is light. And um, so very much um, the, the world of words was my world and the world of music and still is. <laughs> yeah. yes, indeed. And your journey to Christian faith is is fascinating for so many reasons. But, but one of them is part of the story involved you trying to. I guess to some extent, attack the Christian faith or debunk it in some way. And right. it was actually through doing that you discovered that, oh wow, this is actually true. Tell us a bit about right. that story. And perhaps this will be a good good point as well to mention your sexuality, which also formed a huge part of your testimony. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and maybe I'll start with the sexuality and then I'll end up with the why I, um, and I, I don't know, I'm a professor. So professors, we just go to the edge. We, everybody thinks we're fighting when we just think that we're breathing. So maybe that's part of it too. Um, but as, as a young child, um, I was what my, my, peers or my parents would have called a late bloomer. I just just didn't really express interest in boys. Um, now I went to an all-girl Catholic school, so there weren't any boys to express interest in, but um, but I loved, and I also was an athlete. I loved uh, you know, sports and music and and language and writing and, and my and my girlfriends. I loved the company, being in the company of women. And I didn't think anything of that until at a certain point my peer group went one way and I was still like, what, what are we doing? What's going on? And so, um, so it wasn't uh, a great source of, uh, I guess I was used to being a late bloomer on a lot of things and just kind of an awkward, nerdy person. And I still am, you know, I still am. So, so being out of step with people doesn't strike me as, as unusual. But when I, um, when I went to college, uh, you know, men were, were interested in me and I thought, okay, great. You know, this is how it's supposed to be. And, um, I, I dated a lot of men. I even, um, um, you know, some of these relationships became sexual and romantic. And I found myself in this really awkward place of every time a relationship with a man would get to that place, I found myself falling in love with women. And I thought, well, now this is really strange, <laughs> you know, like I'm not even sure what to make of it. So um, by the time I came out as a lesbian at the age of 28, my friends had been saying, you're gay. What do you, what do you, you know? And, and I didn't have any, um, I should tell you, I felt no moral barrier to it. It wasn't like I, I was not wrestling with um, any kind of moral framework or ideological framework. I very much was a, I was the 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 the, the good uh, classical liberal that I was trained to be. Someone who believes, in some ways, I still believe this: that where everybody thinks the same, nobody thinks very much. That part I still believe. But um, but I what I believed then that I don't believe now is that um, you know you're a good person. Um, do what feels right. Um, uh, you know, leave consenting adults alone. Um, those those kinds of things. Um, I was also a, a 19th century scholar, I should say that. And 19th century is what brought to us Freud and Hegel and Marx and Darwin and a lot of the um, the gay rights, um, uh, the paradigm of gay rights, the kind of intellectual underside of gay rights comes right out of the 19th century. So, um, so yes, that was very much in the background. But by the time I ended up reading the Bible for the first time, was I had written finished my uh, my tenure book. So I was pretty much of a you know the tenure was set, and this is at Syracuse University, so it's a tier one research university, and so it's not. Um, it's not a small teaching college where people have to like you very much. You just actually have to be a good performer and, you know, write your books and write your articles and get your hits in um, humanities indexes and things like that. And um, and so that was that. And I started working on a book on the religious right, the rise of the religious right. Certainly in the United States, it probably has a particular flavor that you don't have, but I don't think it's terribly unfamiliar. Um, to you. And I, I, I was basically just curious why, um, you know, why evangelical Christians in the United States wouldn't leave consenting adults alone. I, 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 you know, I didn't really care to interfere with what other people believed because I was, you know, a true libertarian in some ways, but I just really wanted to know why they had to be in my life. And um, so I wrote an article that ended up getting a lot of play in a in a fairly big newspaper. And um, this was back when people read the newspaper and it was given and I had a full back page, uh, you know, ad. And, and the, the, the title that they gave me was was particularly uh, lemon juice in the eyeballs of evangelicals. And um, I wasn't clever enough to make up that title, but I would have if I if I could have. But the title was. Promise Keeper's message is a danger to democracy. So it combined a lot of things. It, it attacked a, um, a, a well-known and, and beloved 
men's evangelical movement. And somehow it attached um, um, religious thinking with a violation of my democratic rights, my rights to be a citizen, which again, that was a bit of a stretch for what the article said, but the the title alone, titles are important in writing, right? Um, well, and yes, that... and, and one, one can imagine at that point in time, one can imagine where you might have been coming from, because of course, as you know, these arguments, they continue to run, don't they? So it's not uncommon to hear people on the liberal left say things like, you as an evangelical Christian who is pro-life, what you're actually trying to do is take away my rights as a woman, interfere with my reproductive rights when it comes to abortion. So one can imagine those would be the sorts of arguments that, that you would be making. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's a particular way that separation of church and state is understood differently on the left than on the right in the US. And so all of that was at play. But I wrote this article and it generated a lot of it caused what we would call a bit of a dust up. And um, one of the wonderful things that came from this was a letter from a pastor. His name is Ken Smith. He was then the pastor of the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Syracuse. And um, the letter basically went like this, dear, dear Dr. Champagne, I had my maiden name at the time, um, we read your article with interest. We have some questions. Uh, would you be willing to sit down and talk with us? Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on these things. And this answer, I wasn't a praying woman at that point, um, but this if I had been, this, this, this uh, letter would have been an answer to prayer, not because I wanted to explore evangelical Christianity to become one, but because um, I was starting a book on the religious right. And I know what I don't know. I'm a legit professor. I know my my big blind spots. And one of those is I don't know Greek, I don't know Hebrew, and I don't even know any true believers who can tell me why they believe what they believe. So I saw this, this letter and I thought, fantastic, here's my unpaid research assistant. I can't wait to have dinner with you, sir. Where are we going? Um, and so that's really how it started. Um, I've always been a, you know, I don't know. I, I liked, I'm a, I'm a writer, I'm a reader. I like to be hot on the story. And so uh, with great interest, I, I called back uh, Ken Smith, and I immediately was met with a chivalrous man, and I had no idea what to do with this. He's a very masculine man, a very um, a very in charge man. I mean, I come from a world where all, it's all the women who are in charge, so that was really interesting, but also an extremely chivalrous man. One of the first things he said to me was, "Are you? Do you feel unsafe?" coming to my home, it would just be my wife and I, and maybe a few members of the church. Um, and he tried to explain to his house, he said, you know, we're a Christian home. So there's a lot of people who come and go. And would that make you uncomfortable? And I thought, how interesting. I said, well, I'm a gay rights activist. And as you know, you know, I mean, this is, this is the 90s in New York. So uh, the, the, you know, the AIDS epidemic was a profoundly, um, you know, it, you know, it had quite an impact on our lives as uh, in the gay community. And so I said, that's so interesting. We practice hospitality in the gay community as well. And my house sounds like it looks a lot like your house where, you know, a few people live here, but all kinds of people are coming and going um, as we're working on political, uh, political activist work. And I should add that too, that I was a political activist. I had co-authored the university's domestic partnership policy, which was the, the kind of policies that rolled right into the Obergefell decision, which was the uh, 2015 decision to legalize gay rights in the United States and redefine what harm means. That's an important thing too. So I, I, was, um, I was all in. And I was all in because I genuinely believed that gay is good and that I was gay and that the world would be a better place if people could just learn to live with each other and not try to, you know, not try to tell each other what to think and what to believe. But I was also pretty confident that evangelicals were stupid and they didn't know what to believe. And so um, I, I had certainly that edge about me, too. And so we met, at, we uh, arranged a time and I went to their home for dinner and I uh, had no idea what I had just walked into. Um, it was, um, to say that the gospel is disarming is a, uh, a gross underestimation. 
Start the year enriched and enlightened with thought-provoking Christian content from Premier Christianity magazine. As a special New Year offer, enjoy a year's subscription for just £24. Subscribe today at premierchristianity.com. What was it about this family, this family home, this dinner that was so radical, do you think? Or is it or is it unexplainable? Is there an element of the Holy Spirit at work and there just being something that you can't quite put into words? Oh, well, I'm a writer. I have to put everything into words. I, I probably I should I, I, pre- I should probably preface everything with my apologies to the Holy Spirit, comma. I need to put this into words. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, um, I like that. Uh, but, well, one thing that I was really surprised by was one of the first things that Ken and Floyd did. I was expecting them. Uh, to be awkward, to kind of dance around the lesbian issue, to basically to be so pure, you couldn't even say the word. And they just started out with, you know, warmly gave me a hug, welcomed me into their home and said, look, we can accept you as a lesbian. We just don't approve. (laughs) I mean, that was, that was, you know, like maybe after, do you want a glass of water or a cup of coffee? That was the (laughs) question. You know, that was the statement. And I thought that was the most refreshing thing ever. Um, Now, first of all, this was 1996, 1997. Um, I didn't expect evangelical Christians to approve of me. And if they did, I thought I would have thought they would be lying through their teeth. I was a beloved university professor. I had approval of all the people I needed approval of. And I didn't need their approval, but the fact that they could just accept me and that we were not going to dance around that was phenomenal because I thought evangelical Christians, I thought this is all, this is what y'all did. I thought y'all just said, Jesus is the answer with no regard for what the questions are. And I thought you all just believed that once you told me Jesus is the answer, I was supposed to act like I was a blank slate. Like, oh, well, you know, but of course, uh, and and it was phenomenal because it told me that these were thinking people. And you know what? These were thinking people. Now, the Bible was opened. And as we would talk about ideas and I I came in, I mean, I was planning on interviewing them. I they thought maybe they thought they were going to interview me, but that I I pretty much dominated our first conversation because I, you know, the clock is ticking and I had a book to write and I, you know, I was hoping I, and I really wasn't sure if I was going to wear out my welcome in that first visit. So I wanted to get, I wanted to bleed everything I could out of them. Um, And they were phenomenal. They had their Bibles opened and they were using their Bibles like it was not a museum piece they were using their Bibles the way I would use literature textbooks or, you know, philosophy books, or, you know, it was meant to be like thumbed through and, and, and it was okay to have it at the dinner table. And maybe you spill a little coffee, you know, it, it, it it wasn't under glass. It was, uh, and, and they explained to me, and I even said to them, wait, you people are using your Bible differently Uh, than I was expecting you to, what do you think about this book? And they said, well, it's alive. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? (laughs) You know, and they, you know, they explained it. They just said, no, 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 we're not kidding. We're, we're serious. You know, you can mock us. You don't have to agree with us, but let us explain what we mean. And then I explained, well, I wanted, I want to write a book on basically why people like you won't live, leave people like me alone to live my life. And um, would you help me? And they said, sure, but you have to read the Bible. And I said, well, I expected I had to read the Bible. I'm an English professor. I'm not a sociologist. I don't just go in and stick a microphone under people's faces and ask cheap questions. I'm, I love reading books. And so that began a dual relationship, a relationship with this book that was both compelling and and quite frankly repulsive at the same time to me and these people who were um gracious and honest and reflective but also unlike anybody else in my in my life 
And, um, and so in the course of the next two years, I would end up reading that Bible through seven times in multiple different translations and probably having hundreds of meals at the Smith's home. Um, and as I was turning the pages of the Bible over, I would find that my heart was getting stuck in some of those pages. And um, occasionally I would share that with Ken and Floy and they handled, handled that tenderly. Um, they were not rough or uh, aggressive, um, but they, we are also reformed uh, Christians. So we, we actually don't believe, um, you know, a, a reformed Presbyterian does not believe that he can make you do anything. He, he believes that it is the Holy Spirit that has set apart um, people for the hearing and the receiving of the gospel and that the gospel must go forward because we don't know who those people are. But but Ken and Floyd Smith were what we would call true believers. So could I be a, a true believer someday? Of course. Was I an image bearer of a holy God? Of course. Um, and so I would meet with them for meals and uh, and for Bible study, really. Um yeah. And I, was there a, was there a point where you realized that it was perhaps morphing, for, or was it morphing from a research project to a Bible study, or oh. were those two things sort of just happening together simultaneously, or was there a point you're like, hang on a minute, I thought I was here to interview them for a book, whereas actually what I think I'm doing is exploring Christian faith for myself. Yes, a little bit of a both, and um, so I've always lived my life transparently in community. That's true now with my Christian community. You know, it's it's a Monday morning here in the United States. We had twenty five people over for dinner last night. I think maybe ten of them were invited. That kind of thing, right? Um, but it's the Lord's Day, and we're Sabbatarian, so we throw the best parties on the block, and that's how it goes. Um, uh, but that means I live my life pretty transparently. It means you see my foils and my and my and my blind spots. Same is true when I was a gay rights activist. My home was a place of hospitality and activism. Um, we were busy writing policy that have become law today, which is part of why I wrote the last book, um, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. But I. Um, my friends, I mean, I remember at one point in particular, we were having our usual Thursday night dinner party with, um, uh, op it was an open house. Um, once a week, my partner and I would just open our house to anybody in the gay community and they would come in and, and tell us what was going on because we were both professors and professors are out of touch and we know we're out of touch. So we wanted to know what Boots on the Ground was like. And at one of these meetings, um, a friend of mine pulled me in the kitchen and said, Rosaria, this Bible reading is changing you. You are uh, you are changing. This is not safe. And I I remember, um, I, I, you know, you know how sometimes good friends will do that. They'll put into words things that you you fear, but you haven't even articulated to yourself. And I I just I remember blurting out we were alone in the kitchen and I remember blurting out. But what if it's true? You know, what if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? And what if we are all in trouble? And this friend, this friend was a biological man who lived full time as a woman. And um, what he said to me was this. He said, I, I have often believed that what you're saying is actually actually right. And I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years and I prayed that the Lord would heal me and, and he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. Uh, and then and then that was really shocking. You know, that was, but I often tell people this because, you know, if you want to know what gay rights activists talk about in the kitchen, sometimes it's that. I mean, sometimes it's other stuff too. I understand. We wrote a lot of policy too, but but you know, the eternality is written in the hearts of all men. Um, and so that was a very powerful conversation. First of all, I hated it because I didn't think I needed healing. I believe that gay is good. And I didn't 
have cancer or bad knees or a bad case of acne. And so I just keep your healing language to yourself. I, I, I loathed that. Um, but it also didn't even seem very biblical to me. I'd read the Bible through a few times and it didn't even tell me that the, the Bible didn't say I needed healing. The Bible said I needed to repent of my sin. And I, I liked that even less. So, um, I, I, you know, I was completely unsatisfied with the biblical response, but, but, but completely drawn to the idea that there was somebody in my world who had also read the Bible through many times and had poked around in it for life help and meaning. And, um, and the next day when I came back from work, my friend had, well, I found two large milk crates of theological books. It was my friend's books from seminary. And all of a sudden I started reading the Bible differently because this is back in the day when people actually read books. Here's King Lear, I'm teaching that this week, you know? Um, and in the margins of books, if they were your book, if they were a library book, Sister Mary Margaret would, would snap you on the knuckles for doing this. But if it's your book, you would write comments in the margins. And so my friend had written many, many comments. In fact, there was an entire life journal in the margins of Calvin's Institutes. And, um, and I felt like I had been given a great gift and I needed to steward that gift well, both the great gift of the my friend's heart, but also the great gift of this theological library that he was now divesting himself of. Um, and so, so that was a turning point for me. And I, I, um, I decided I would take stock of my life at that point. Like, okay, something's going on here. And this isn't just a research project. And so I looked at my daily calendar. That was also back in the days when people would keep these big, looked like a phone book. It was a calendar and you would record everything you did so that you could be really productive. It was called the Franklin Covey approach, seven habits of highly effective people. And everybody was trained in this. And so I went back to my calendar for that year. And I realized I had been sent spending two hours every morning in Bible reading and prayer. And that was after my research leave. During my research leave, I had spent five hours a day reading and rereading the Bible and making notes on it. And it almost terrified me when I saw, I mean, it would, it would almost be like an obese person looking at your, like your journal and realizing, oh no, you know, you, you really did eat all the donuts, you know? And so I, 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 um, I really did eat all the donuts, you know, I, that was it. And, but then I realized something even more startling. I had answered my question. You know, my question was, why do Bible believing Christians not leave people like me alone? It's because they really believe the gospel is good news. And I all of a sudden understood, not only did they believe the gospel is good news, but I could accept that for some people, that gospel would be good news. I couldn't understand how it could be good news for me because I thought I was a lesbian. That was the sticking point for you. The, the fact that you were attracted to other women, you were a lesbian, you just thought there's no way that someone like me could find the gospel good news. And presumably that's because because you were your understanding of the gospel was, you know, you cannot be that. You cannot date other women. You can't be with other women. And that was important to you. Well, I, I press it even harder uh, because the gospel, the first word of the gospel is repent. And so I was trying to just wrap my mind around this. How do you repent of something you think you are? And when I realized that that's the juncture I was at, I decided, okay, game over. I'm throwing this book project away. I'm a 19th century scholar. I can easily write another book on Frankenstein. Let's just get on with this. And I pretty much told Ken and Floyd I was done. We didn't need to meet anymore. The, re the research project was done. Thank you very much. You go about living your life. I'm going to go about living my life. And um, basically, I tried to break up with Ken and Floyd Smith. I've tried to break up with my Christian friends. 
And while they didn't become stalkers, they became, they were pretty close. They, basically, they wow. were not going to let me go. They were not going to let me go. And that's when, and by that, I mean, you know, they continued to invite me over to allow me to help. I should say there was a certain reciprocity. They had, you know, I was a bread, bread baker, you know, we, we shared some things back and forth and, um, yeah, they wouldn't let me go. And that's when I articulated the situation to Ken and Floyd. How do you repent of that which you are? And they said, why don't you think that's what we all had to do? Do you not understand what original sin means? Do you not understand what repentance means? And I said, no, actually, I don't. And Ken said, okay, then we're going to I, I have a lecture. I'd love to give it to your students. I said, no way. You're not talking to my students. What are you talking about? I'm not, you know, um, but I'll give it to you instead. And so Ken and Floyd came over to my house and they presented this um, material that I had never heard before. And it was, it was basically the history of the world in the context of what the gospel is and what it does. And I remember taking copious notes that night, the kind of notes where you make a column down the middle of your paper, paper what the teacher's saying and how, how you're fighting with it, you know. But I remember that night, um, two things. One is deep in my heart was a longing to know this God who, who wants to be known. And the other was a reality that if I could believe the things that Ken Smith said, I would be better off. And the things that he said were the basic theology, the way that we would understand it as Christians, is he was giving me, without using a, a doctrinal category for it, he was teaching me about my sin nature and that the sin nature that would be there in Christ also, that it's not that the sin nature goes away. So he he was giving me a kind of, D diluted uh, explanation of John Owen when John Owen talks about um, what internal temptation is, internal temptation, actual sin, and indwelling sin. And although we, we talked about James 1, he didn't hit it super hard. He talked about James 1, 13 through 15, as the life cycle of sin, talked about how temptation isn't innocent. When it's external, it's sinless. But when it's internal, when it comes from inside, it needs to be mortified. It, it needs to be repented of. And then he talked to me about the ingredients of repentance. And this is what the Puritans, uh, there's a Puritan writer called Thomas Watson, and he wrote about, he wrote a book called The, the Doctrine of Repentance. And and, you know, repentance has six ingredients. And for me, I was raised Catholic. I'd gone to confession. I mean, I knew, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been, you know, 47 days since my last confession. I could say it in my sleep. In fact, we used to have competitions of how fast you could say the rosary, um, which became very helpful when I became a debater later on in high school, because you could, you know, but I, so I, I was like, wait, 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 wait. I don't even know. I mean, repentance to the priest Jesus who is alive and sits on a throne at the right hand of God the Father, this was a lot to take in. So the six ingredients of repentance were really also very striking to me that the first one is that you have to recognize sin is sin. So basically, for as long as I kept saying, well, sin is who I am, not how I feel, you're never going to get there. So there's the there's the recognition, the sight of sin. There's the... Um, the sorrow for sin, the reality that although not intended, uh, my unchosen sin, and that's the Roman seven part that comes in, my unchosen sin hurt the, my Lord and Savior. Um, and then there's the confession of sin, owning it, not praying the gay away, not saying, Lord, deliver me from these temptations, but saying, I confess, I desire that which you hate. And then the fourth, and this is, of course, very, you know, don't say this today, um, shame, the shame for sin. Um, 
and um, and and finally the turning from sin. The uh, way, the way Ken Smith would put it is the Psalm one hundred three verse twelve reality that God puts your sin as far as the east is from the west, and so. So, uh, you know, every time you repent of your sin, it's a new day. It's a new day with a new slate. And um, and you are to now ask God to replace unholy desires with holy ones and see what he does. If you, Rosaria, and you, Sam, and you, everybody listening to us are really the clay and the potter says that, who are we to say, well, you can't do that. You know, you can move mountains, but you can't not make me gay. You can move mountains, but you can't change my feelings. I mean, come on, my feelings. Uh, there's a funny quote from Jane Austen. She was being satirical when she said this, of course, because she's the satirist. But she said that her sore throats hurt more than everyone else's. And I sometimes think that when I'm talking to evangelicals today, especially those who call themselves gay Christians, that they want me to believe that too that your sore throats just hurt more than everybody else's. Well, God says no. God says these feelings are a bear, but learning how to hate your sin without hating yourself is basic Christianity. And Ken Smith told me that that's what I needed to do. And that is so often the sticking point, isn't it? Of, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like this identity of gay is is me and mm -hmm. you know th that then becomes very hard i think to repent of whereas if you can distinguish and say no this is not my identity this is not who i am this is something that offends god that i'm repenting of i'm not i'm not saying it becomes easy of course it doesn't but it's it's that's a very different ask than feeling like you are repenting of who you are as a person I Absolutely. And that's where I really think Romans 7 comes in. It's the most, I think it's the most compassionate. It's, it's, a, it's a love letter to anybody struggling with a sexual sin that feels like it defines you. Because Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do? It is not I, but sin in me. Now, that's the, that is the sexual strugglers, uh, you know, that's the life jacket for the sexual struggler that actually wants to be a real Christian, not a fake Christian. You can be a, you can be a counterfeit Christian and you can get there by claiming that the word of God can't go there. It can't go all the way down to my lesbianism. It can't root out my gender dysphoria. It can't go there. And if you say that, you are the clay fighting with the potter. Now, I do understand it feels like admitting that God has full cross reigning rights over you is terrifying. I I completely understand that. But it's the only way to the victory of the cross. And it isn't just people who struggle with a gay identity or a trans identity. Every person who knows the victory of the cross has had to do that. There isn't one person who claims the blood of Christ as that which has washes her clean, who has not learned how to hate her sin without hating herself. Now, does that mean that everybody who was gay is now heterosexual? Not everybody, but I'm going to say a bunch of us. I, I, I mean, I'm just going to say, I'll, you know, that that could be that could be hating words right here on on uh, premier Christianity, and I don't, I'm not trying to egg for a fight here, but the truth of the matter is an entire generation of people have been told a false understanding of James 1. They've been told that their homosexuality is not a sin unless they act on it. So they've been told not to repent of it at the level of desire. Now, what that does is it takes a whole generation of people and says to them, 
don't repent of your sin when it's small enough that you might have mastery over it. Wait until your sin is so gigantic that it is controlling every aspect of your life, thought life and physical life, and then try to go to battle with it. And you know what? It's a lot easier to uh, it's a lot easier to fight sin at the level of desire than it is at the level of a person whose name is on the lease of your apartment. Yes. So uh, we. We're striking a, a really core issue in this whole debate, and it comes up in your in your latest book as well. Um, and if I could just set this in some some brief context, both in the UK and the US right now, if you say that you are a Christian and you go to a particular denomination of church, some churches will conduct a gay wedding. There are some denominations that teach there's nothing wrong with two men uh, being in a gay relationship with each other. Um, there are plenty of other denominations, of course, that don't teach that. But the point is, there's there's a group we can broadly label affirming um, that would have a very different view to, to you on this. There's also another group, though, and this is what you're getting at, who would say, I don't believe that two men or two women should be in a in a sexual relationship. I don't believe that's God's plan. That's God's best. And this group of people would say something like, I'm going to choose to live a celibate lifestyle. I'm not going to engage in what I believe is sexual sin. But some of this group would identify as gay Christian. They would say, my desires are still to want to date other men or date other women. I'm choosing not to follow those desires. Um, but what's interesting to me, Rosara, is is even in this conversation and in your writing, you've been very outspoken, at, not against just this group of Christians who are saying we want to do full, fully fledged gay weddings. There's nothing wrong with um, with any of this. You've actually just in what you've said, you've you've. You've been on the offensive against this group who call themselves gay Christian, who actually they share your theology on the sexual ethic. You and they would both say that um, we d we don't believe that that gay weddings, gay sex is is morally right. You and you and they would both agree with that. The only difference is this issue of desire that you clearly feel so strongly about that you think that desires themselves should be repented of. So my question to you is, is why why pick this particular battle over desire? Yeah. Why is this so important when actually, arguably, there's a whole bunch of other people who are much further away from uh, from the the same uh, view as you are on the uh, on the actual issue of sexual ethics? Right. Well, because we don't share a sexual ethic, <laughs> we, we do not share a sexual ethic, and this is not an intramural. I don't know if that is you know this isn't. We're not on the same team. You know, just having a little scrimmage here. Um, and I know way too many people who said, my desire for other women is a, is a good desire. God gave it to me. It is a good desire. Or they might say, it's merely a temptation. It's not actually a sin. It's just a temptation. It's only a sin when I act on it. And then they would use James 1 to defend that when James 1 cannot be used to defend that, when James 1 gives you what Thomas Manton would call the life cycle of sin. Uh, and that is because th there is a, and the reason we do not share a sexual ethic is it is a heresy to say that. And a heresy, it's a big word. I know that I'm Reformed Presbyterian. We use these words all the time. Uh, it is a heresy because if it's, it, br it brings a faction into the church, that is untrue. It brings, it brings an untruth into the church, a false teaching, but that false teaching has already been declared a false teaching. That is called Pelagianism. And it's where you believe that you can have desires that are against God's teaching that are somehow not sin in and of themselves. The way that Romans 7 puts it is it's an indwelling sin. You know what an indwelling sin is? It's a sin that's in your heart. If sin is like a robber, like a robber who's about to steal something from you, and your plan is the way I'm going to deal with being safe, I'm going to be safe by always making sure that I lock the door when I enter my house or my apartment, my flat, I lock it. Well, if the robber is in your closet, Right back there, locking the door outside doesn't help. How do you get rid of the sin inside here? Because that's what's driving any unholy desire. And so we would, in my denomination, we would not say that this is intramural. I do not share a biblical sexual ethic because action 
is not just what I do with my body. The 10th commandment tells me that. If you turn to your Bibles to Exodus 20, verse 17, the sin of coveting is a sin that isn't yet acted upon. But there's an entire an entire commandment committed to it. So I don't share a biblical sexual ethic with someone who says, this is merely my temptation. I don't need to repent of it. There's one person who doesn't want you to repent of your sin. That's Satan. Any theology that follows that, that, cat, that bandwidth is doing Satan's work, not the Lord's work. And that's, you know, and you can really see it too in the, um, you know, there's another book that I think is extremely helpful in thinking through these things. And this is another Puritan and it's called um, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And one of Satan's devices is the way, uh, the way that uh, Brooks will put it is to paint sin in virtues colors. And that's exactly what gay Christianity tries to do. And you know what? I'm not arguing about common grace. If you came and said to me, Rosaria, who are the best neighbors on your block? Who are the neighbors that, you know, take care of their flower garden and walk their dogs and, uh, you know, come to every picnic you throw with two casseroles? I could easily say it, it's my neighbors who identify as lesbian. So I am not arguing that there isn't a great deal of common grace in the LGBTQ plus movement. I remember that. I tell people the hospitality guess, uh, gifts that I honed as a lesbian, I use every day as a pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about saving faith. And that's my great concern with gay Christianity, side A or side B. Quite frankly, Sam, if I believed that, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be talking to you. But no, it's great victory. And you know, the victory isn't necessarily always in um, how quickly you are sanctified. Because what we're talking about is progressive sanctification. And what side B gay Christianity denies is that it's possible that you can have what the Westminster Confession of Faith calls, you know, the subduing of your sin such that you can go on and do other things other than be burdened by your sin. But the reason that we fight our sin as Christians is because the tomb is empty. And just for those those who may not be totally tracking with the with the terminology, side mm -hmm. A, are those who say I'm a Christian, I don't believe there's anything wrong with same sex uh, relationships. And side B is that group I I described a moment ago, who would, who are, I I said would agree with your sexual ethic. You deny that. You say no, these are two different sexual ethics. But a side B person would say, I identify as a gay Christian, but I'm choosing not to act, not to act on my, uh, on my desires. Um, and that's interesting. You say neither side nor A B you believe are a, a biblical, um, mm -hmm. uh, dealing of, of with the issues. I I mentioned at the beginning that um, your conversion you've described previously as messy and dangerous. And I, I did want to touch on the cost that, that came with this decision and ask you, I, I guess, a, about that that time where you, you made the jump um, across and, and said, I am, I am now a Christian and what that cost you socially, because I think it's important to talk about that and recognize that even though we talk, talk, don't we, about the pearl of greatest price and you sell everything and the Christian faith is, is the way to live and it's God's best and it's fulfilling. It does also come with a cost. So can you tell me a little yeah, bit about yeah. what that was like for you personally? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, I never really took a big leap because I'm a big coward. So I, I crawled a few inches. And then when I tried to run back to like my lesbian partner, I found that that the, the Lord had 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 destroyed the bridge over which I walked. So the Lord is very tender with me. I'm a very weak person. So so I, I never took a big leap. I, I did it one day at a time, one step at a time. But I did keep finding myself that as I would move forward, even if I tried to run back, the Lord, I, it was blocked. So there were two major costs that I, that I had to face. One was the cost of being 
someone who were was potentially betraying the people I loved most in the world, which was my gay community. Can you imagine how horrible it would have been to be that student who had um, come to Syracuse University um, internationally to work with me? I'm the, I was the only person directing dissertations at that point in queer theory. And before your plane lands, I've now become a Christian. I'm not I'm not directing any dissertations in queer theory. I'm only working in a new field and you know it so one cost was the reality that i was hurting people and that i was betraying people and that was a very painful cost to them more so than to me but um that was never i, I you know i think i told you at the beginning of this podcast i wanted to be a legitimate do gooder i never wanted to hurt people but this is what happens when you are deep in your sin you know, I was, you know, I wasn't 18 years old. I didn't have a, a spider plant and, a, you know, a, a folding table. My, my partner and I had a home and we had a small business together. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, she was a professor, but we had, you know, we did this golden retriever rescue thing. I mean, it, you know what I mean? There were a lot of entanglements. I can't even imagine how much worse it would be for somebody now if you add a legal marriage, children, I just can't even imagine it. So the first is the reality that I hurt the people I loved most in the world. And then the second was the reality that the career that I had worked so hard for, I might be walking away from. I mean, I was tenured. And so I was never fired from Syracuse University. I did have to go before an ethics board and explain myself. And, you know, that was pretty awkward to say the least. Um, but, um, um, but yes, I mean, I had a great deal of cultural capital and, um, you know, and I don't anymore. I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, well, you do, you do in a whole different sphere, if I can put it that way. I mean, as you say, you were directing dissertations in queer theory and you, certain feminist credentials, and you're now writing books that says that feminism is wrong and homosexuality is wrong. And while, of course, your original community, if I could put it that way, I'm sure would, would not be a fan of your work, to put it mildly, you have now got a kind of new community in the church, in Christianity, in large sections of it, obviously. I'm not saying all Christians agree on the issues, they don't, but in a, in a large section of the Christian community who read your books um, and who hear you speak and who would see you as really flying the flag on some very difficult issues that some yeah. Christians, frankly, don't want to touch. But, but you're willing, as you say, to talk to talk about these these big issues and to uphold but, what you view as a, as a biblical ethic and to, to a certain extent, to campaign for that. But it wasn't like that at first. And I wasn't I wasn't even asking for it. I mean, I, you know, I, I had the great and this is the other issue I should we have we haven't mentioned this, but we should. I have been biblically married to my husband, Kent Butterfield, for almost as long as I've been a Christian. And there's no question in my, in my life that that explains part of the victory over the sin of homosexuality. I am not suggesting that you should get married as a way to like force God's hand in these ways. But in my case, marrying my Kent, who's a tender, wonderful, gentle, kind, but also strong leader, it it just gave me the covering that I needed. And then my children, of course, and now grandson, that gives me the rootedness I need. So there are a lot of things on my list that I can't do in a given day because of my covering and my roots. And that has been really good. So the first 10 years of marriage, I mean, you know, with, with a church plant and college ministry and children, we were uh, my husband and I, I think we signed 10 adoptive placement agreements. We have four children. We adopted two children out of foster care at the age of 16 with severe trauma. Um, I that, Those were not glamour years, Sam. I'm not even sure I combed my hair, you know, uh, once a week during those years. I mean, you know, <laughs> the Lord's Day. You know, one always cleans up for the Lord's Day around here. But um, yeah, nobody would have looked at me during those years and said, wow, you know, I think you should go speak at a big evangelical conference. They would have said, wow, I think you need to go get a haircut. You know? <laughs> and, um, but those were good training years. I learned the basics of carrying my cross and the basics of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of just the amazing reality, what, of, what it means 
to be an image bearer of a holy God as a woman, right? You know, we bear the image of God as a man or as a woman. And to be a caregiver and a nurturer, to be a mother, to be a wife, now to be a grandmother, those are just irreplaceable. I couldn't, there was nothing in my life that had prepared me for that. But yeah, those are messy, um, you know, not they're not glamour. They're not glamour jobs, but uh, boy, are they do, worth it. Do you, do you ever wonder um, what life would have been like had you not encountered that couple and kind of accidentally started doing those Bible studies? Every day. Two things. And that that's part of what motivated the writing of the last book. There are there are. And maybe it's my age, you know, I'm 61. I'm seeing my window close here in this conversation. But um, this is the world I helped create. And not just as an unbeliever. So the the five lies of our anti-Christian life begins with my repenting of the sins that I've committed as a believer, which I believe are worse sins because they're committed against the blood of the Lord Jesus who saved me. And these are sins about softening the gospel, about not somehow, even though, you know, Ken Smith held out to me a pure gospel of clarity, and in some ways it was hard, I then went on to muddy those waters for way too long, way too long. Um, and so, yes, I think about that all the time, that in God's providence, um, this Christian couple who originally met with me to discuss an article I wrote at a newspaper went on to be the people who put my hand into the hand of the Savior and changed not only my life forever, but the life of my children. And, and I think that is that is the pure message of the gospel. Our names need to be forgotten. The name, the mighty, compassionate name of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be remembered. But it's not going to come by programs. I think it's going to come, you know, hand over hand, um, neighbor to neighbor. That's part of why my husband and I run a house that looks a little crazy probably to some of my neighbors, although I hope they've benefited from it too. A house where Christian hospitality can be found in a pretty regular, sometimes even nightly way, um, because we don't want to lose anybody, um, because I'm really grateful that I'm here and not there. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. common grace, absolutely. I had lots of common grace, you know, in my previous life, but that's, um, that's not what we're talking about, ultimately. Yeah. And just finally, then, imagine if, if I weren't a Christian, maybe I was agnostic, and I'd put it to you that you've had, if I could put it this way, two different very halves of your of your life so far in two very different worlds. And what if I were to say to you, Rosaria, how can you be sure? How can you be sure that you've, you've switched from the wrong path to the right path? I, I wonder what you'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Well, m my previous life as a um, kind of liberal communitarian, um, that was very much based on my ability to make sense of my world between my two ears, right? It, it, it really relied on a rational materialist discourse, everything that we could touch and hold and see. And apart from my ability to win an argument, maybe to persuade you um, with, with uh, a, a good argument, you know, I've, I've studied logic before, so I can put together a good argument, or even persuade you with a number of philosophical texts and books that rely on other people's personal experiences, that was all I had to prove myself. And in fact, I would never have claimed to have truth. I would have said we had truths, plural. Um, and those truths were um, you know, often bifurcated by things like point of view. I see things this way, you see, see things that way. And so that world could make peace with contradiction um, uh, maybe not anymore, uh, the liberals I talk, you know, but, but that world, back when I was in that world, we could make peace with contradiction. But today I have this book 
I have this book. I have this Bible. This is, I'm a big uh, study Bible fan. So I'm, you know, this is what I'm working with here. Um, Cause you could do your bicep curls with it as well as, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but I, I have this Bible here and it is not only my guide to faith in life, but it is the only answer to the questions that my soul has for you. Well, Rosario, sadly, we are out of time, but um, we have finished on some big issues, which I know are further unpacked in your latest book. It's called Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age, and it's out and available everywhere. But um, I've so enjoyed hearing your story. Thank you so much for sharing with us today on The Profile. It's been a real treat. Thank you, Sam. Lord bless you. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.